Amen. It is good to be with you today to get into uh, the Word of God. If you weren't have been with us for the last uh, few weeks, uh, we're continuing our sermon series on the Book of Psalms, uh, 2024. We've labeled it as our Year of Biblical Literacy. We're walking through uh, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, and we're looking at the different genres that we find in the Bible and hopefully growing as students of God's word as we understand how to understand and study and be transformed by God's word. I want to start with a story today. Uh, when I was in college, my roommate, uh, he was a, a business major and he had to do an assignment for this marketing class that he was in. And so he was like, I just got to ask you a few questions. If you can answer the questions for me, that'd be great. I was like, okay. So he started asking me, and he kept asking me questions about why I do the things that I do. And then I, I might say like, well, because I wanted to. And he'd be like, why? I'm like, I thought it'd be best. He'd be like, why? And well, it would benefit me in this way. And he said, why? And he kept asking the question why. And he did this about a number of things. And the whole point of the exercise was to realize that actually these decisions that you're making, you're making them in one way or another to find contentment or happiness in what you're doing. The whole point of the exercise from a marketing perspective is that if you can help people understand that your product will make them happy, they'll be more inclined to buy your product because everyone is in a search for contentment and joy and happiness. It was the whole point of the exercise that we all seek contentment. I would go as far as to say we all need contentment. Which means if we need contentment, whatever you believe is going to ultimately give you contentment in life has power over you. I'll say that again. Because we need contentment, it's not just something that we want, but it's something our hearts will continue to search after time and time again. Whatever you deeply believe will give you ultimate contentment in this life actually has control and power over you. I'll take it a step further. I'll try to prove this as I work my way through the sermon. I would say whatever you truly believe the most gives you ultimate contentment. Not only do you need it, not only does it have power over you, I would say it becomes your God. It becomes your God. Let me explain. Our text today, Psalm chapter 16. Let's get it started at verse one. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord... You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. So you want to notice one of the things that's important, especially as we're going through our year of biblical literacy, uh, is to understand who the author is talking to. So this is a Psalm of David, and we see the audience, as far as verse 2 goes, is the Lord. He says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Then we see the audience change in verse 3. He says, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. He's saying, I find delight in the people of God, the saints, the holy ones who are followers of God. Verse four, he continues to address the saints, the followers of God. In verse four, he says, he tells us, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion. And my cup, you hold my lot. We're going to focus primarily on verses four and verse five, verses four and five today as we uh, work our way through Psalm chapter 16. I'm fascinated by these two verses being right beside each other. That he goes in verse four from talking about those who worship another God and how their sorrows will multiply to God being his chosen portion and his cup. In verse four, he says that those who run after another God, so that, that's what we would refer to as idolatry. Idolatry is any time we place creation in the place of the creator. Anytime we, we look to the creation to give us something that can only be found in the creator. Anytime we elevate the creation to a place that we worship it, or maybe we desire it more than we desire God. We trust in it more than we trust in God. We look to it for contentment and joy and peace more than we look to God for those things. The Bible would refer to that as idolatry. It's worshiping the creation over the creator. And it's saying those who do that, their sorrows will greatly increase. See, the practice of idolatry is to roll out the red carpet and, open, and opening the door for sorrows into our life. I'll say that again. To practice idolatry is to roll out the red carpet and open the door for sorrows to increase in your life. 
Now, not all sorrow is the result of your idolatry, but idolatry will greatly increase the sorrow in your life. And he goes as far as to say he won't pour out their drink offerings or take their names on his lips. See, at that time, a, a drink offering is pretty foreign to us, for most of us. But a drink offering was a, an act of sacrificial worship towards whatever you believe to be God. So David is saying, I'm not going to participate in the idolatrous practices or the practices of worshiping a false God. Because I'm not going to do this. He knows that God is not calling him. To do that. He even goes as far as to say, I'm not going to worship them with my words either. He says, their names won't be on my lips. And then verse five, we see that it says, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. If you were serving yourself some food or maybe something to drink, get yourself something to drink, and you can get as much as you want it. You can get whatever amount you thought was best for you. Whatever amount you stopped at, you would be saying, that is my portion. That's my chosen portion. I could have had much more, but this amount is good for me. I am content with this. It's a way of saying, this is enough for me. So when David is saying, the Lord is my chosen portion, what is he saying? He's saying, God is enough for me. That he is what I choose. I could choose from the many things that I have access to in this life, ultimately for contentment and joy. But when he says that God, the Lord, is his chosen portion, is his cup, he's saying, I've determined that God is enough for me. It is that he is sufficient to meet the needs, the spiritual needs, the deep felt needs that I have. That I don't need more than him in order to be content. That's what David is saying. Uh, one of my kids recently, uh, this, was, this was probably actually a few months ago, there was this, this period of time where they kept using the phrase, I'm good, I'm good. So it's like, if you have this, do you want some more? I'm good. You have this, do you want this right here to go with it? I'm good. See, seeing God as your chosen portion allows us to see God and then consider everything else that the world has to offer and to be able to say, even if I don't have a lot of the other things that I might want, I'm good. Because I have God, I am good. So in verse four, David makes a statement of how idolatry doesn't go well for us and how he won't participate in it. Then in verse five, he tells us that the true and living God is enough for him and he's good because he has God. Verse four leads us away from putting anything over God or putting anything in God's place. Verse five leads us to understand that we can find contentment in God. And I'm convinced that these two verses are written here combined together with each other because as David and God both know, whatever you believe will give you the most satisfaction and contentment and happiness and joy is what you will worship. It will become your God. You will follow it and hear me on this. It will control you. You were created to understand that the realist that the deepest and most satisfying contentment is found in God and thus surrender your life to him. That's, how, that's what we were created to do. See God, understand that he's greater and better than everything else, and I will find no joy in anything as high as the joy that I find in my God. And thus I surrender and submit to him and I obey him. And what I'm saying to you today is that when we replace God with something else, when we believe that I can find the deepest and most real contentment in something other than God, we have elevated that thing to God's status in our life and we will submit to it and it will control us and we will worship that thing. I'll try to give you a quick example from my life. There have been years in my life, and this is a very timely word for me. There have been years in, in my marriage. I've been married for about 13 and a half years at this point. There have been years in my marriage where I was less good of a husband and a father during football season. I'm going to say that again. There have been years in my marriage, since I've been married and had kids, that I have been less good of a father and a husband during football season. Why? Because somehow I began to believe that what I truly need for contentment and satisfaction in life is to give as much attention to football as it requires of me. As much attention as I am told I need to give to, I need to know the scores, but I don't just need to know the scores. I need to see the highlights. I need to see the stats. I need to see it in live. I need to see it live and in person as well. Not in person, but live when it's occurring on TV. And it pulled me away from my God-given responsibilities. It pulled my attention away from where it should be time 
and time again. I wasn't as present with my family as I should have been because I believed that contentment and satisfaction, I was so twisted to believe that what I wanted most would come from entertainment. And I gave over control of my time, energy, and attention to a football game because my idol, what I believed to give me contentment was controlling me. For some of us, our desire, if we're going to be honest, can we be honest today? For some of us, our desire for other people to accept and approve of us or think highly of us has us in a chokehold. I I love the song that we sang not too long ago about the acceptance that we find in God. I love that. But if we are honest, a lot of times we so value the, the opinions of others or meeting the expectations of others that those things can lead us, or I should say control us, and lead us away from God. I'm not saying it's wrong for people to approve of us or think highly of us. All that is fine, but it becomes a problem when we elevate those things to God's place. Let me be more specific. Some of us feel like we need the approvals of others so much to be content that we neglect our own health and well-being trying to meet other people's expectations of us. Some of us have convinced ourselves that we're, we're doing it out of love for the person. Like maybe someone asks us to do something and we've convinced ourselves that it's just really sacrificial Christ-like love that we're practicing and why we're doing the thing for them. But truly deep down, if we asked enough questions, if we searched our heart deeply and profoundly enough, we would realize I'm actually serving them for me and not for them. Because it's not that I'm actually doing this because I love them, even though I might love them. I'm doing this because I don't want them to think less of me. I don't want them to think that I don't care about them. So I'm willing to overwork myself, to overfill up my calendar and my schedule, committing myself to things that I shouldn't be committing myself to. And then because we Christians, we like to baptize it in Jesus and say it's because of the sacrificial love of Jesus in my heart. When really at the end of the day, when really at the end of the day, it's closer to manipulation than it is love. Because what I'm really wanting to do is get you to feel a certain way about me. Really what I want is to get you to look at me in a certain light. Really what I want is to boost myself up by controlling how you see me. I'm being controlled by my approval idol, by my acceptance idol. I fear your rejection, so I'll do the thing that I think you expect me to do, even though it's not what I should be doing at the time. I'm trying to preach today a little bit. Some of us complain about how busy and stressed we are. (laughs) And the root cause, for some of us, the root cause of our very high levels of stress and anxiety for some of us is we are unable to say no to the people that are asking things of us because deep down we're afraid of what they will think about us if we say no. We don't believe we can be content and be at peace if our friends or acquaintances or our parents or our children or our spouse or whoever doesn't think that we are the kind of person that they expect us to be. So we'll neglect our own health We refuse to embrace the reality of the good need for rest that God has given us all. And for some of us, we'll say we're super stressed and anxious because of how busy we are. And I say for many of us, we're stressed out and anxious because the sorrows of those who run after another God will multiply. The sorrows of those who run after another God will multiply. If we're going to fight against this, I'll give us a, in, a, in a little bit some ways to fight against this, but I just want to in, in, insert this here. we got to be honest with ourselves about why we do the things that we do. If we're going to successfully wage war against the idolatry in our life, especially the deep-rooted idolatry in our lives, we've got to be able to be honest with ourselves that this is more about the love for ourselves than it is for the love of others oftentimes in what we do. We need to be honest that there are things that we have put over God in our life that allows us to acknowledge that these things are bringing sorrows into our life, which opens us up to being able to repent and turn away from those things. For some of us, it's not acceptance and approval. For some of us, the false God that we worship, that we bow down to, is a felt sense or felt need to control everything in our lives. 
We believe we can't be content unless we are in control of our lives. We so deeply and profoundly doubt God's power and his goodness in our lives that we feel extremely worried if we're not able to direct everything in our lives. If our lives aren't going the way that we intended them to go, then we feel an extreme amount of worry. Or when our plans start to break down, then we feel a deep sense of worry in our lives because we have so deeply and profoundly doubted the goodness and power and sovereignty of God in our lives. And the crazy thing about having an idol of control is in many ways, it's really an idolatry of self. So when you talk about idolatry of, of other people's acceptance, you're actually elevating someone else into God's status in your life. And so you care more about what they think about you than you care about what God thinks about you. That's the idolizing of someone else. When we idolize control in our lives, that's not idolizing someone else. That's making a play for the throne. That's us intending to dethrone God in our lives because deep down we believe we know better. Because deep down we believe our life would be in a better situation and everything would be better if we were in control and not God. God actually doesn't have this thing figured out. He's not doing what's best. I know what's best. Truthfully, I should be on the throne and God should listen to me. Truthfully, God should be, I should be God's consultant. He should be coming to me to figure out how to best direct my life so that I can inform him on the proper decisions that he should be making for me and my loved ones in my life. It's a play for the throne. It's an idolatry, but it's an idolatry where we elevate ourselves because we believe that we know better than God. We believe that we're more trustworthy than God is. And the problem is controlling our lives is above our pay grade. We ain't built for that. And the deep and prolonged worry and oftentimes anxiety that we feel when we, when we realize how out of control we are, when our plans aren't playing out the way that we want them to, is evidence of what David tells us in the psalm and that the sorrows of those who run after another God will multiply. You chased another God. This one time it happened to be yourself. You chased another God and it has brought sorrows into your life. For some of us, what we really believe will cause us to have contentment in life is if we could just be free from all obligations, if we could just be free from all commitments, if people would stop asking things of us because we idolize our comfort. If people just leave me alone and stop expecting things of me, I'd be content. Now, don't get me wrong. Comfort is not a bad thing. Being comfortable is not a bad thing. In 1 Corinthians the Apostle Paul refers to God as the God of all comfort. In the book of John, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the comforter. I'm not knocking comfort. Some Christians have taken this too far and say, and to believe that if you're doing anything for the sake of being comfortable, then it's an idol. That's not what I'm saying. The comfort in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's a good thing, but we can just tend to idolize it like we do with many other good things. Some of us can tend to avoid uncomfortable situations uncomfortable conversations, even when those uncomfortable situations and conversations are good for us and for others, even when those uncomfortable situations are from God and God wants to use them to strengthen us and make us more like him, we prefer to avoid those things. Some of us are right now putting off a conversation that you know God wants you to have with somebody. Maybe God wants you to challenge them in some way. Maybe God wants you to pursue reconciliation with them in some way. Maybe God wants you to correct them in some way. I don't know what the reason for, for you putting off the conversation is. I don't know what God wants you to do in that conversation. But oftentimes, as Christians, division comes in the people of God because we idolize our comfort. Oftentimes for Christians, the fellowship of God, the fellowship of saints in the body of Christ doesn't go the way that God intends it to go because we idolize our comfort. We're putting it ahead of God. We're putting it ahead of God's plan and his will for our lives. When we idolize comfort, we resist against God when he tells us to do difficult things. For example, God might be telling you, you know it'd be good for you to make yourself get up and worship with the saints. Shout out to everybody who's here today. <laughs> God might be telling us, you know it's best for you to reach out to that person in your life group to see how they're doing. God might be telling us, don't go to that website. You know that that's just gonna lead you to lust. God might be telling us, you know, you don't need to be flirting with that person because, you know, deep down, you just want to have sex with them. But oftentimes our desire for comfort. 
causes us to want to dismiss whatever God is telling us, whatever God is warning us about. Because truth is, oftentimes we worship our comfort more than we worship him. Because truth is, oftentimes we obey whatever would lead us to comfort more than we obey the true and living God. So for me, that raises a very important question. It raises the question, how do we know if something in our lives is an idol or not? How do I distinguish between something just being something that I like, something that I care about, something I desire, versus it being an idol and we putting it in God's status in our life and in our heart? How do I distinguish between the two? And I think David gives us a clear, one clear indicator, there, there could be others, but one clear indicator of idolatry in verse 4. And it's something that we can look at to help us discern whether or not we have put something over God. Let's read verse four again. It says, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Then David says, their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The drink offerings referred to here, they're referring to an idolatrous practice. They're referring to something that David knows and is aware that God has called him not to do, but he sees people that worship another God participating in those things. And he says, those drink offerings, I will not pour out. He knows that God does not permit him to participate in those things. So what's the indicator of idolatry? How do we know if something is an idol in our lives? The first most simple basic question is, does it lead you to sin? Does it lead you to sin? Does it lead you away from what God is calling you to? Does it control you so much that you do things that God doesn't want you to do because of how much you love and desire and want this thing? Most of us aren't going to make our way to an idolatrous physical altar of a false God and pour our offerings to it. But when we allow something to lead us to sin time and time again, We're essentially pouring out our offerings to that idol that is in our lives. We're essentially doing the same thing. I mentioned before that sports has been an idol in my life. How do I know that it was an idol for me more so than just something I was interested in? It's because I saw myself being willing to compromise what I knew God had called me to do and the God-given responsibilities that he had given me as a husband and a father. That was an indicator for me that that had become an idol in my life. So the question is, what causes you to sin? What leads you to sin? What causes you to lie and be dishonest? That's a quick one. What causes you to lie and be dishonest? What causes you to be deceitful towards others? What causes you to be jealous of others? Y'all know that's a sin, right? What causes you to be jealous of others? What is it that someone else has that when you see it or think about them with that thing, it makes you angry at them or feel like your life is not complete? that you don't have enough in your life? What is that when you see someone else with it, it stirs up an anger in you towards them? Or what is it that when you see someone else with it or think of someone else with it, it makes you feel like your life isn't complete or maybe God doesn't love you or maybe God isn't looking out for you or maybe God doesn't want good for you? What causes you to believe that? That's likely one of your idols. What causes you to forsake spending time with God? We talked about in the sermon series, the benefit of praising God, the benefit of meditating on God and taking time to remember who God is and what he has done for you. And don't just say you're busy. This is the question we got to ask. This is the question we got to ask. What are the non-essential things in my schedule that consistently find their way into my schedule when time with God is not consistently finding its way into my schedule? What are the things that continue to be there? Non-essential, not essential things that find their way into my schedule. I find myself repeatedly going to them over and over and over again, especially if I am struggling to be consistently spending time with God. What choices do you make that prevent you from making time to praise God and meditate on him and remember his goodness towards you? What makes you busy? Maybe you've idolized your career. Maybe you've idolized your children. Don't hate me. Maybe you've idolized your children and you think you need to be available to them 24-7. Maybe you've idolized other people's opinions of you so you fill up your schedule with the stuff that other people want you to do no matter how spiritually detrimental that is to you. 
What leads you to forsake spending time with God? What leads you to not be generous? Now, if you barely make enough money to provide for yourself and for your family, I'm not talking to you right now, but for everybody else, what non-essential thing do you believe that you have to have so much that you don't have the, the money or the resources to be generous towards others or towards God's work? I'm going to say that again. What non-essential thing that you don't have to have do you consistently put money towards that prevents you from being generous towards others or towards God's work? What non-essential things are you putting over generosity, which the Bible would say is an essential thing for you? The Bible would say generosity is essential. That it's an important and necessary aspect of your life if you are a follower of Jesus. What non-essentials get in the way of that for you? That's likely an idol of yours. There's another one. Who in your life causes you to compromise what you know to be right? Who in your life causes you to compromise what you know to be right? If you will consistently sin because of the expectations or desires of another person, you have idolized that person in your life. You have elevated them to a godlike status in your life. This can be a friend, a family member, a boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, employer, acquaintance, whoever. Who in your life causes you to compromise what you know to be right? There was one time... Uh, I was working uh, when I used to be a personal trainer uh, back in the day, and we were, my boss was training someone else who just came on staff. And one of the things that, that we would do as trainers, sometimes we were kind of involved in sales with the gym as well. And he was trying to let this, my boss was trying to let this new trainer know, basically sometimes, in, in his words, you need to do whatever you need to do to get the sale. And my boss looked directly at me. He knew I was a Christian Knew I was playing over. I don't even know. If, I might have been a pastor at that point as well. He knew I was a Christian. And he said, Aunt knows. I mean, sometimes you might have to bend the truth a little bit to get the sale that you need. Right, Aunt? Is what he said in the moment. Right, Aunt? It's time to make a business decision. Because I, I, I knew this person had some amount of control, right, over my job, over me at my job, how long I was able to work there. And I looked down, I ain't gonna lie, I thought about it. I was like, Lord. And I said, I see what you're saying. I don't personally believe that. I said, I see what you're saying. I don't personally believe that. It took, a, it took for me at that point in my spiritual walk, walk I, I felt it, it was an insecure moment for me. It was a moment of, of God, I'm trusting you in this. How is this going to go? Good thing is the story does end up well. And, and, and my boss ended up coming to me and telling me, he was like, And I'm embarrassed that I asked you that, and I appreciate your integrity in that situation. But the point is, as the people of God, as those who follow him, if there is someone, anyone that will lead you to compromise on the righteousness that God wants you to live in, that person has now become an idol in your life. But David says, their drink offerings of blood, I will not pour out. I will not pour out. Christians in the room, I want, to, I want to ask you a question about that, and I don't know if you've thought about it, but how do we do that? How do we, when we have given something control over us to the point that we are committing sin because we're idolizing that thing, how do we grow out of that? How do we seek to be freed from the, from the grip that idolatry often has on us? How do we stop pouring out the drink offerings at the altar of these idols that we have found ourselves to worship? And this is why I love the combination of verse four and verse five. I'll read them again. It says, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my life. David essentially says, I will not worship a false God. My God is enough for me. Remember what I said earlier, you will worship whatever whatever you believe will bring you the most contentment in life. Here's the secret to effectively fighting against idolatry in your life. Family, you worshiped your way into idolatry. You got to worship your way out. You worshiped your way into idolatry. You have to worship your way out of idolatry. You turn to that idol because you believe that it offers you more contentment and more joy than God and his plan and God's will for your life. So what you need in your fight against idolatry is the knowledge 
an experience of the contentment that we have in our God. Oftentimes it is in our contentment and in the enjoyment of Christ that the allure of sin loses its grip on us. It's true what Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 says, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Praising God, meditating on God, remembering the goodness of God in the way that leads us to joy in God isn't just good because joy feels good. It's also good because joy in God empowers us to say no to sin and thus worship our way out of idolatry. So uh, one thing I've been trying to do recently is, is value my, my physical health a bit more. And I'll tell you, my biggest weakness, I, I, I tend to drink my calories. I don't know if there's anybody else like this. The sugary drinks, I, just, I could just drink it all the time. And especially at nighttime, especially at night, I just, I, could, I can consistently just drink half, probably close to half my calories for the day right there. I could do it. And I've tried a lot of things to help me stop doing it. There's only one thing I found that works. There's literally only one thing that I found that works at all. When I am intentional about that afternoon and that evening, drinking a lot of water to make sure I feel hydrated, it's like I don't need it anymore. When I'm sufficiently hydrated, it's like I, don't, I, I can say no to it. I still want it, but it doesn't have the grip and control on me that it normally does because I've had enough already. Because I'm good and I'm hydrated with what I have already had. And I know many of, of us have been there as well. There are days when you're walking in peace and joy in the Lord and the things that you have been tempted to do, when, when you just feel the peace of God in your life and joy from in your life, they don't have the same grip on you that they normally do. When, when you're walking in peace and joy and contentment in life, you're more easy. It's easier for you to say no to those things. You can just say, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need that. It's the times when, we, when we're weak. It's the time when we're lacking joy. It's the time when we're lacking peace that oftentimes it is so difficult for us, feeling impossible for us to say no to the allure of the temptation that we have fallen to time and time again. The days when you feel like you have the least amount of peace and joy are the days that you feel most weak oftentimes and more easily given over to temptation. I want us to look at what Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 14. He says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. When you've drank deeply from and enjoyed living water from God, you don't need other things to complete you and satisfy you because you're good. I'm good. My, my, my heart is content. I'm finding peace in God. Family, many of us think of resisting and fighting against temptation as us just making sure we're disciplined enough and we're mustering up enough strength to say no to sin. And don't get me wrong, we need to be able to be persistent and consistent and disciplined in fighting against sin. But some of us need to realize that it's a lot easier to be disciplined to do the things that you enjoy and delight in already. I'll say that again. A lot of us, when we consider our fight against sin, we need to realize that it is a lot easier for us to be disciplined and consistent in, in doing something when we enjoy and delight in that thing. There are things in your life right now that you enjoy, you delight in, and you do those things consistently. You don't even consider it to be disciplined because you just enjoy it so much. But you are consistently practicing those things that you deeply enjoy. One of my favorite foods is cereal. I can eat it. I can eat it at any point throughout the day, throughout the day. I can literally at any point throughout the day, I can have a bowl of cereal and greatly enjoy. I don't miss when it comes to cereal in the morning. I don't miss. I'm not trying to be disciplined. I don't want to miss it. I enjoy it. It's my thing. Every single morning I'm going to have it. Now, normally I wouldn't even consider that to be disciplined, but it's actually I'm disciplined. I consistently do. I'll say no to whatever I need to say no to. To make sure I can have it, I'll say yes to whatever I need to say yes to to make sure that I can have it. A lot of the issue for many of us with fighting against idolatry isn't that it's not just solely a lack of commitment. It's a lack of remembering and experiencing joy in God by consistently going to him and reminding ourselves of how good he is. Verse 11 in Psalm 16 says this, the last verse in that chapter talking about God, it says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Some of y'all, y'all know that I do this from time to time. I asked a question on Facebook this week. 
I ask Christians, what difference do you notice in your life when you're consistently spending time with God? That's the question I ask. What difference do you notice in your life when you're consistently spending time with God? I don't have time to go through all the responses I got. You can go to my Facebook and look at it yourself. One person said, my level of self-control and obedience is higher. One person said, I am quicker to lean into peace when I'm spending time with God. One person said, some of the things I had to fight not to do at first are not struggles to me anymore. There are still some things, but the major struggles I will fight with and sometimes lose to are no longer struggles for me. One person said, my anxiety is lower and the noise is not as loud. I can hear him clearer. I can see for what it is and I'm not as easily tempted. The last two people said those things are in this room, by the way. One person said, my level of self-control is greater. One person said, I'm quicker to depend on his sovereignty and trust him in all situations. One person said, I have more peace, more clarity, more confidence, and an abundance of these things. I could go on and on and on. I'm hoping that you see the point. David made the point that the sorrows of those who seek after another God will multiply. But what we also know is that the joy of those who continue to seek after the Lord, the peace of those who continue to seek after the Lord will also multiply. That the truth is, if we, if we worship our way into idolatry, we worship our way out by continuing to seek the Lord. Plot twist, that's always an application of the sermon. Continue to seek the Lord. Family, satisfaction, contentment, and joy are a much more effective way to fight against idolatry and temptation than trying to muster up the strength and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and white knuckle your way into sanctification and holiness. To turn away from idolatry, let us worship our way out of it. By keeping in mind, as we've talked about throughout this sermon series, by keeping in mind that we can go and meditate on God, that we need to be reminding ourselves of the goodness of God, that we can continue to make time to praise God, to remind ourselves of how good he is. We need to be consistently spending time in this presence to experience the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. Family, y'all pray with me.